very warm welcome to this special on a Monday evening. It's myself and my co-host Eastold Cody. She'll be on just one moment. We have a pretty interesting lineup of stories to chew down on this evening. We were hoping to get Andrew Flint in, but unfortunately he is stuck out in Siberia. It's snowing very, very heavily, by the way. It snowed massively in Moscow today, so it's not a good thing. Um, so we've got a few stories we're going to look at. We have one opinion piece that we want Isol to run her ear and eyes over and also her brain to sort of like give her opinion on it. But we're going to start off right away, introduce Isol to you. Isol, uh, a very happy bank holiday Monday to you. Hello, happy... Uh loyal breed. I think we're just past the actual calls for it here, but yeah, we have a new bank holiday in Ireland since last year. Great excitement. <laughs> Look, it's up, St. Bridges Day is always great to, to celebrate. I'm, I'm up for it all the time. Um, Issa, we're going to under, well, we're gonna get underway in just a moment, but first, um, the is it or isn't it on or off Usyk Fury fight? Fury pulled out with a cut. It was a genuine cut. You can see it. Um, now he seems to be forced back into the ring by his Saudi owner. Uh, is this fight going to take place? I suppose I've been listening to a lot on it, as one would expect over the last few days, but also just uh, perhaps it's the dates for me. I almost forgot until this weekend that it was the start of February. So if we're saying he is going to need, looking at the cut, and I'm no medical expert, but you were talking six to eight weeks for that to be fully healed before he can get back in a ring, how long before he will then be sparring? And you can't go into a fight against the likes of music without some form of heavy sparring in the lead up to it. So if they're talking about the revised date of the 18th of May, that seems very close all of a sudden. Um, we're ruling out February, which is, as we all know, a shorter month, but we're ruling out the month of February. We're probably ruling out most of March at a minimum. So then we're saying he's going to go through April, maybe into May without... You know, he's, there is going to have to be a level of caution in his sparring to ensure that this cut doesn't open up again. Um, it's a very tight time frame. And again, I suppose, irrespective of how tight that time frame is, if we see Uzik and uh, Fury meeting in the ring, you don't want it to be with the caveat that, oh, there's an excuse in the background for this performance, et cetera, et cetera. I also do think we've obviously missed the end of Riyadh season date, but they do already have other fights in in May and the start of June. So we're going to see Bivol and Baturbia at the start of June. And the Saudis will also be hosting um, five matchroom fighters against five Queensbury fighters, which would be a big night as well. And obviously we're going to see AJ and Nganu, um a crossover event. But I, even though it will be actually classified as a boxing fight, but it's crossover in my head. Um, I think the big thing here and the, the, the real takeaway I know we've discussed um, with the difference in a strange, fortuitous way that this is a Saudi event that has fallen out of bed. If this was an event that was due to take place in three weeks, sorry, two weeks time in the UK and people had bought, sponsored and invested Wembley or Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, TV wherever, the was, well, yeah, wherever had bought into this and was running it with the refund level and the sponsorship pullouts and the idea that maybe it, you know, there'd be that fear of it going ahead again. I don't, I, I think, it would have been a death knell to the fight. Whereas with Saudi money and Saudi comfort around the idea it will happen again, we still run the possibility that, that this will happen. What, whether it will or not, waits to be seen. I think the May date is very tight. Yeah, it, you know, this is it again to try and heave up to get the sparring in, especially for a world heavyweight title fight. In a fight that almost certainly is going to lose, it's, 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 um, it's no win for Tyson in any case. First story up, uh, this is one that has been rumbling long and just yesterday he has gotten his lawyers involved to basically stamp down on the uh, stories. Now we covered his shenanigans in, in detail in Kappa Sports 2.0 during lockdown where he now he, he's had a, a sort of dodgy pass in that sense in his off-field behaviour. Um, you know, he's, he, he married two years ago his long-term girlfriend. They have three kids together. They were together for 10, 10 or 11, 12 years. Um, but then, it, you know, during the 2020 lockdown, he uh, and one of his friends hired uh, two sex workers to visit him. Um, this, of course, he's, when he's with Manchester City. Uh, he also then traveled to visit his sister. He visited his parents as well. Uh, and then he went on to say that, oh, it was very, very stressful because of mental health, because of people harassing his family, because he was breaking lockdown rules. Of course, he was, nothing had happened to him. Zero had happened to him. He just got away with it all. Uh, Last year, last March, of course, he was, uh, or he allegedly exposed himself in a 
pub in Manchester to a woman, and then they said that the charges were going to be dropped. Last month, of course, just well <laughs> over a week ago, uh, it was. Um, it turned out that he had fathered uh, two kids with the model Lauren Goodman, um, and of course, then the, his wife comes out with this amazing story that you know footballers are cheats that the girls throw themselves and you know at them, and that's what she sort of gets along with. Um, or sorry, that, that this is now Nicola McLean, sorry, who who had married uh, Tom Walker. So this is kind of uh, you know. It's insane, but it is a case we saw where a lot of these young guys, you know, they, they come and let's just be very straight about it. They come from mine from pretty rough backgrounds. Uh, they've got very little sort of guidance of being, they're not told to do anything other than kick a ball. They are basically told they're, you know, untouchable, they're the best. So when things are handed to them, it's easy for them to take. They don't have that kind of, where they say, moral codex uh, in many, many senses. Um, Give you two minute take on Kyle Walker and why has he hired lawyers to defend his name? I suppose I don't, I don't suppose it's necessarily defending his name that he would be hiring lawyers for at this stage. It is protecting against further stories um, emerging. That would that would be how I would view it and perhaps trying to put a sort of a handle on what is coming out and what isn't. Um, there have been obviously a number of interviews. There has been one with Lauren, who is the mother of one of his children, which I think was conceived during a split from his um, wife, pre a previous split or break in their relationship. And I think that was one of the points discussed. His um, wife, we should also be very conscious of, is now heavily pregnant with a fourth child. So I suppose when we discuss any of these stories and the moral culpability or moral compass of footballers, high end sport, uh, high level athletes, what we need to do is we need to stop and remember that perhaps we, we while we see the specifics of the story, um, footballer X cheats with X person, um, or footballer gets involved in domestic abuse incident, NFL player, etc. I think there needs to be a certain level of media responsibility in how it is re reported. So obviously Kyle Walker has given an interview and I think the Sun during the week dedicated four to six pages solely to Kyle Walker uh, stories. But I think there needs to, there does need to be a sensitivity to how it's reported. I don't agree with super injunctions. I think they set a very mm -hmm. dangerous precedent if that's the route um, athletes or indeed politicians, et cetera, want to go down. What I do think needs to happen is when they are reporting, I think some of the specifics in terms of children's name, ages, where they live should be taken out. In the case of obviously um, Kyle Walker, the mother of his other child, um, Lauren had given an interview and the one of the interviews which I sort of saw it was a clickbaity article it's like this is the house she lives in in x place where he that he bought for her and they described the house that I'm sure to an estate agent in the area they'd be able to tell you exactly where it is but there's also a, a level of discussing the children or the child and the child's age and I, I think there needs to be a sensitivity that these young people are going to grow up and someday get to read these stories if you want to say footballer cheats fine take some of the detail out that doesn't relate to adults in the story. Remove the children's names, remove the children's ages. Don't discuss things like that because that is an unnecessary feature. And yes, a child will always be the child of X superstar player or athlete, but there is a, a, there is a way of perhaps creating a level of not necessarily anonymity, but a degree of separation from people who did not choose to put their lives in that, that platform. Um, I also think there is a level, of course, that you're saying footballers in particular, I suppose, since we're discussing Kyle Walker, that there seems to be a focus on there's no consequence for their behaviour. This week, if Andrew was here, I would be saying we saw it with Marcus Rashford with his trip to Belfast and his night out where he's on video and you're kind of going, how are you going to call in sick tomorrow? And yet he did, because there seems to be, because they're paid at such a level that a fine has absolutely no effect on them. But I think that lack of moral culpability, um, it's easy to say when we've seen Kyle Walker's history of incidents over the last while that maybe his moral compass isn't as finely tuned as others. Um, and as sad as that is for his children, I, I, I suppose I don't like to see children being dragged into it. In terms of Marcus Rashford, he's someone who we see has an incredibly high moral compass and an incredibly high sense of civic responsibility. So when you see him go and just ignore all of that, you kind of, part of me thinks, do we put too much of a spotlight on these people and wait for them to fall? Because 
at the end of the day, we're dealing with young people who have been given huge amounts of wealth um, for, you know, years from their very young age. There's been no one there unless other than business managers and hopefully a responsible parent to try and guide them in these things. And everyone around them is likely to be a yes man. We say it about lots of athletes, particularly, I suppose, yeah. there have been a lot of boxers who we've said they're surrounded by yes men. Of course they are. Conor McGregor, surrounded by people who are profiting from the Conor McGregor world. So I understand that. But I suppose with when we look at any of these stories, I have no problem on us discussing an athlete's bad behaviour. I think I have a real issue with the level of detail that comes about in terms of the children, so much so as naming children, etc. And I, I think that goes both ways, I should say. I also don't think on the part of, let's say, the mother, who is the person who is uh, the other half of the story. I don't think she should be giving that level of detail either, because I think it's someone else's story. It's that child's story in years to come. It's that child's name in years to come. Look, you're dead right. And we, we see, like, I mean, this is this is a, a constant thing. And so it blew up in, in uh, Spain last Thursday. Because we remember the back, uh, well, what, in on, on international duty, uh, Phil Foden and Mason Greenwood paid a hotel employee to smuggle girls into the room. That was a big story. We did that as well, of course, on, on, on yeah. Capital Sports. Um, Mason Greenwood then went on to, well, we know what he did. Or, well, we believe we know what he did, allegedly did with his partner. Again, we covered that live on air at the time when it was breaking. Uh, we played a recording on air, which I think, you know, got us a few slaps from people, especially my United fans said that we shouldn't do it. It wasn't right. But we broadcast it live on air uh, on the radio and people, you know, could hear what was going on. We were able to then discuss it as well. Um, Mason Green, of course, now he's down in Spain playing with uh, Getafe and he had a run-in with Jude Bellingham last week where it seems that Jude Bellingham called him a rapist. Now that's again that's under investigation. I'm not great. I'm not great at lip reading, but I think I think it seems to be a universally. It looked like it. It definitely. Well, I looked at. The, I'm not going to play it because I think it's it's something we don't need to, to display. But it definitely looked like he did say the word. And but again, anyway. I just to caveat, this is someone who has not been convicted of anything. That same partner, I think, is still with him. Obviously, um, language language is very important. Over the years, we've had certain words that have had very nasty connotations that have changed in how they're used etc cetera, etc cetera. one word that doesn't change in how it's used is calling someone accusing someone of rape as a or calling them a rapist it's very clear what the intention is and um, yeah. i'm sure if that's there's an investigation to be had there and whatever the outcome of that there will be consequences if it's found that it's gone a certain way and um, i think again it's one of those things where thankfully we can with accusations of rape there is usually a level of anonymity to the alleged victim in that instance obviously the alleged victim it, it was very common and very common in public knowledge who the person well, she, was just, she herself she herself put, put her, da her dad her. also so, was very quick at coming out yeah so th th this is we have to we have to but do we have to say that that the family the girl and her father put it so um okay move on to the next story one is which we discussed again on air we got a lot of criticism over we got a lot of brick bats more brick bats and bouquets now of course is the uh, valley of a story camila uh, she's still not even 18 she's only 17. um she was 50 at the time that she got caught doping her main excuse which she used was that she was staying with her grandfather she was using his cup that he used to take medicine and so fair enough i mean i'll have a glass I might put, say, sulfidine or maybe aspirin or disparin, like you know, to, to, to take away pain. And someone could use it after me, and there might be some slight traces. But what she was caught using uh, does help performances and does help uh, competitive figure skaters. Now, of course, we see here on the left her, her coach, and we had a pop up that personally I had some difficulty with in terms of her behavior. But she is now coming out and saying that, like, God love her, she think it's fair. And of course, all across Moscow, in a number of billboards, they had, we're with you, we stand with you, we believe you. But again, this is just the latest in a number of ridiculous, pathetic, disgraceful excuses. Like Sarah Aradin, the tennis player from Italy, saying that um, she got this very good performance enhancing drugs that made her a better tennis player into her system because uh, pasta was made on a, 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 a tabletop or a, a, a top of a, a surface top in her kitchen where her mother had been mixing her cancer drugs, her mother's cancer drugs, obviously. So again, we've seen this with Shelby Hula again with her Mexican burrito. And, you know, 
boys with their cocaine kisses and Martina Hinga. Like, it's just, it's insane. Um, but first of all, this is a child. She was 15 years of age. At the time, we said that they should immediately go after her guardian and her coach and her coaching staff. She should never have been on the ice. If she was that sick that she needed something to go on the ice with, she should have been off the ice. She should have been gone. Four years, Eastold. Is it fair? And you think, is there a way around it? It's very, very difficult because I think if we are treating an adult, um, or treating a child, because she is a she was a child at the time of this uh, occurring, if we are deciding to treat them as an adult in terms of professional athleticism, they have to be responsible um, in terms of knowing the risks. Yes, I appreciate when you hear her excuses. I, I suppose my difficulty with the excuse the excuses here are the coincidental fact that what was in her system would have been a performance enhancer in her given sport and that it just so happened that her grandfather was taking a medication which would coincide with this that's a difficulty but do i think that a young person came up with this excuse on her own no not for a second if it was concocted it certainly wasn't by her and i think the, the bigger issue here is yet yeah, we have to factor in that four years at four years, it will not ruin her career. Let's be realistic about it. If we watched even the games um, this year, World Athletic Championships, we would have seen athletes returning after four-year bans who are considerably older. It will impact her career negatively in, the, in terms of she will have four years off the ice and off competitive events, but it probably won't end it for her. The bigger issue here is, again, the coaches, those around her, because... Either she was not well enough aware to realise the risks in cross-contamination or else someone concocted the story for her, in which case they should not be involved in the sport much quicker than her. Because if she had something in her system, she very unlikely got it for herself and coincidentally knew it was a performance enhancer in her sport. We're not talking about an adult here. We are still talking about a child in terms of the ability to source out these things and to then, after the fact, concoct a reason. I do think there are two other factors here that come into play. Um, we do need to remember that for all the times we hear absolutely ludicrous excuses and we think, oh my God, what the hell? There will be, for every 20 bizarre excuses that are completely illogical, completely unbelievable, there may be in that 20, that one genuine case where something has happened that seems insane, but it just has actually happened and that's how something has come to be in someone's system but the other factor here is the russian factor and this is not to harp back to rosada or any of the doping it's the fact that at the moment with russian athletes encountering sanctions around the world it is the perfect time to pitch billboards in support of someone the perfect time to run campaigns saying this is a conspiracy against us because it ties into a, a notion of everyone is against Russia, as opposed to what is really happening here, which is a four year ban for something being in someone's subs a substance being in someone's system. But I think that ban is disproportionate, not in terms of the sanction on the athlete, but disproportionate in the sense that they're not going. What are the other factors here? If there is someone who is getting a child to do this or else assisting in coming up with this reason those people are the people we need to keep out of our sports and we need to be as tough on them as we are on the athletes and i think that's sometimes where sanctions fall down yes there are a lot there is a huge amount of scope within the various punishments for people not being able to associate with certain people keeping certain people out of sports but when you're dealing with a child there is a responsibility with any ban that you take the highest steps to look at if you're banning a ch someone who was a child at the time who was facilitating that, if you believe she doped and you don't believe her reason for the contamination, then your responsibility as a governing body or as the sanctioning body in terms of um, with an anti-doping violation, your responsibility is to protect any other children from having the same. I think, look, this is we, we've had on from not just from America, but about you say America, Jennifer say, and we've also, you know, we, we've had people on with us discussing UA, USA gymnastics and the abuse, uh, carried out, uh, the abuse carried out against young women, young girls in USA gymnastics. And that was all done to win. So basically, people ultimately, like to, to Brizzy, her, her, her coach, people won't care what she's doing with her young athletes, if she screams it and makes some 
fast, makes some turns them into anorexics, doesn't make a difference because she gets results, she wins. And that's that's a huge, huge thing. So you're dead right. So it's a perfect time to say they're all out to get us. Well, yeah, but you put yourself out to, to be gone. And unfortunately, this if we if we think, if we believe this is only in Russia, that this only happens here, then we are seriously deranged. But it also has to start at home and clean up. So Lisa, you're, dead, you're dead right. Quickly going through the last couple of stories on this. This is a very, very short video. This is one that had a pretty big reaction, but then was kind of buried up very, very quickly. And we'll just do a very, very quick one minute take on this. Game, set a match, meet you up. Two sets to lock, six, two, six, four. That's the uh, younger Elisaveta uh, Cutler, uh, Lisa Cutler, and she shook hands, well, kind of shook hands with Vladimir Minchev. And then we discussed, of course, with um, Ukrainian athletes refusing to shake hands or acknowledge Russian or Belarusian athletes or, or even Serbian athletes or Hungarian athletes because they feel they're siding with Russia. Now, the coverage of this, for example, Daily Mail has said that because it's an unwritten rule, it's not, it's actually a law in Ukraine, you cannot associate with them. This poor girl had to apologize. Her father said it was a moment of weakness. Shortly after, um, uh, Diana Yastrzemska, who'd be one of the more successful uh, Ukrainian players, she came out and said, oh, well, like, you know, she was just emotional and confused. So that's, you know, again, it's insane. So again, she was condemned. She got terror threats. Her uh, parents' property was, uh, well, it wasn't, it was basically, raided basically and that they came in they, they they checked their documents and they checked what they were doing they they asked they confiscated their phones no their phone their electronic devices sorry that's what it is. so yasremska said uh, now dan is a good person in, in 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 every sense so she basically said look this is it's nonsense she's just a young girl she's 16 years of age so we go from one young girl being pushed down by idiot adults and another girl being pushed down by idiot adults it's a one minute should this kind of pressure be put on kids and does this show more about our society than the you know than the idiots who are, who are making these stupid laws and rules this could be a very short minute because i'm just gonna go no um it's <laughs> all no it's almost like a reflex and looking at that uh, like i'm um, they're not going up and embracing it's like your automatic reflex where you're like end of the game i go up i shake hands with my opponent irrespective of what goes on during the rest of the time it's also a teenager in a highly pressurized situation she's just ha finished a game and she literally is walking up claps hands it's not it, there's a it feels like when you see something like that it feels like someone is there watching and waiting going like there's someone there going a list of oh here's times when we will have russian athletes encountering um athletes yes. from ukraine yeah. let's get a list of all these and see if we can see any of them do something that we should punish, sanction, report on. Sometimes people just have a, they, they just follow the course. They go up and shake hands. Have you ever seen a match where you'll see two players who are going at each other the whole way through, final whistle goes, shake hands because they're done. It's a reflex. It's and like they mean, exactly. They've been punching the heads off each other. And like, and some, but there are some that have real needle in the buildup that's very genuine. And it's still, it's it's a natural instinct. It's like your brain shuts down from the adrenaline and the pressure and you just do something. I think we've got to a stage where we need to look at how, again, how these things are reported on. Why is this something? Because if it wasn't reported on, that family wouldn't have had anything to endure. If you feel it is such an egregious, awful offence as a prosecuting body, you go and you have that discussion with that person individually. You don't allow it to be reported on. Like, it just feels a bit like someone hanging around waiting for that to happen. And it's a really, it's a sad reflection. Um, I'm, it, it's not, this isn't anything negative about Ukrainians. It's nothing negative about Russians. But it's a sad reflection sometimes in both of the stories we've just discussed, where children are the ones who are essentially being persecuted. And because a 15-year-old at the time, a 16-year-old now, they're children. Look, we, 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 we started off, uh, okay, we talk about boxing, but we started with Kyle Walker and protecting the kids. This is it's the same thing. Like, this is the same thing. Yeah. And I mean, if it was my kid, I mean, Tim's close to that, to that age now. If he was going through it, it would be terrible. And the, the one thing as well that, that a lot of people got really 
bugged out by that this went viral across social media, especially on Telegram and on um, Twitter by these NAFO trolls. So basically people who are living in America, they're living in their parents' basement in Milwaukee or wherever it is. So they, they, they basically have, have latched onto this and basically reported on it. And they were calling for her to be sanctioned and to be in trouble. They, and, and so when, when I started reading through the tweets, I'm going, going your adult's picking on a 16-year-old girl. Are you, are you sick in the head? So again, the, the Ukrainian government or Ukrainian authorities were forced to act by these clowns who really, I mean, it was a horrible situation. So we turned out. So, um, in that, uh, going to finish up on this, la well, la second but last, um, this was an interesting one. This is about the Nigerian team and the African Cup of Nations saying that they are being witch hunted. So this is what's happening is that they're being chased, they're being uh, over tested. So eight so, so eight players tested for doping and Victor Zmin has been tested twice and they were really furious with the Nigeria saying is are picking us you're picking us but so realistically let's let's be honest if you were clean what's the problem test me exactly um one of the it's one of those funny things where clean athletes generally don't complain about being tested they're the ones posting pictures of them being now you do have the few who post pictures to try and make a point but if you're a clean team if you feel you are genuinely being victimized in the sense of they're trying to if you were of the view that the testing authorities were coming in and testing you and knew there were other teams that may pop hot but they were focusing on you so they could say we tested we did 100 tests and 100 came back clear but then there's athletes over there who would definitely pop up. So it was being done a certain way, a deliberate way to avoid either potentially uh, finding dopers or not. you're just trying to not take the risk and trying to inflate your test numbers, then fine, complain away. That could be a genuine reason for a complaint. You may feel, or you may feel that there's a prejudice there. Fine, if there's a prejudice there against a particular team, where does that come from? It generally comes from a perception of, athletes from if, if it's against a team there's generally a history in a country of doping um i do get that it would be frustrating if you felt you were the only athletes being tested and i i completely appreciate that um but there also is you know there needs to be testing across the board so the fact that you're complaining about it hopefully it means that they will go and test more athletes bring the numbers of tests up and even if that brings a higher rate of positives then surely it's a good thing for the sport we've seen that by the way obviously in boxing in the last few months and i i, I hate to harp back to boxing but it's funny we have seen so many people going oh god there are way more people like popping hot and you're going no they're just testing more people and they're catching people which is better like so there is that sense of you need more tests if it's all focused on one athlete like surely he has to ask what he did to deserve that or like maybe someone just really likes spending time with him. There's a tester out there who has it for him and is determined. But the, there think, is there is target testing as well. So they of do course. if, oh, no, if, no, if no, things don't Yeah. I mean it's it's why they, they basically uh they have the testing times where it's you know it could be like from certain times in the morning because they want to catch people and they've done it. Yeah. They you know demanding to do it and of course then athletes will they won't answer the door they will run away. We saw I mean the funniest thing I think of all was, was the two thousand and four Olympics um the two greeks on the motorbike trying to escape you know and i mean you kept any sound i think it was and i mean it, it was just um why would you try to get away on your bike and have a crash and i mean it's and of course we we saw this uh, this weekend with uh devin haney uh trolling um connor ben with eggs yeah like you know, so again um he said, uh sort of question and this is like in your opinion, do you feel that there's a very good chance that Conor Ben did do something wrong? I, I, well, he did do something wrong. His system, the tests prove something was wrong. Do I believe his excuses? Well, he didn't accept the excuses put forward by the WBC to begin with. Do I think there could be an arguable case for contamination? Potentially, but he hasn't given anything into the relevant authorities and I mean the relevant authorities, to substantiate his claims where anyone can look at it other than the WBC and say, oh, actually, there's a very good arguable case. And until he does that, who the hell knows? All we know is there's one thing for certain, he failed on more than one occasion. That's what we know. 
on a positive tennis note, I feel you would appreciate this. I am in the background here. Emma Radicanu is in the first round of the Marseille Open. Oh, very um, good. She has come back from, she was 3-1 down and looking like it was only going one way to go 5-4 ahead and is now serving for the first set. And it has been a really composed, I, I suppose, comeback. When you go behind by that, she is just, she's getting she her here. Uh, she is playing Buskova. Buskova, no. A, a fairly lowly ranked in the tournament and I think slightly older. Um, okay. But Emma, I think, is... I think she's the eighth seed in this. I could be wrong. Is, is the player she's playing, is she is she a uh, Romanian? She could be. I'm Was not to the start of it. But um, she's she's just come back and she's... Yeah, she's about to win the first set. Okay. But it's just been... Like, there is, a, there is a good example, I think, of a young player a young person who had huge amounts of pressure piled on her and hasn't gone off the rails am amazingly which is yeah i mean she's fired as a coaches uh but yeah she hasn't uh gone off the rails she, so she, she hasn't done a, anything where you kind of go this is all yeah. gone a bit uh, and and by the way, it's it's it, she's playing mary busco it's in yeah. abu dhabi abu it's dhabi. abu dhabi why did i think yeah. it was on marseille they're oh, still they're still on the uh Middle East, Far East tour. There you go. So, do you know why I thought it was Marseille? Because I started off by watching men earlier. The men's indoor, yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, my brain is gone, and I, it just moved on to this. And I really enjoy. I have to say, I really enjoy Emma Redacano's kind of her last, maybe the last year or so. She's when she's been doing interviews, really, really composed, really maturing, and maturing in terms of in the right way. I think. That you can obviously yes coaching changes happen but that's probably also part of the thing of you're growing up and realizing what will and won't work for you and you do True. have to experiment don't do a kyle walker on experimenting no, that's a different no, no. that's the wrong way to go on that note, i thank you very much Isol cody and thank to you. everyone home as well uh so just say we'll be on of course next weekend as well so right now go home take care of yourselves and each other